This is episode 208 of the Stem Cell Podcast, translating stem cell research discoveries with Dr. Ilya Sinyech. Hey everybody, we are Drs. Daylon James and Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. A quick note about our upcoming schedule. This is our last episode before the holidays as we'll be taking a short break, but don't worry because we'll be back on Tuesday, January the 11th with a brand new episode featuring doctors Ru Gunawardane and Caitlin Gerben, who are at the Allen Institute for Cell Science. So make sure to check back in in the new year. Today, we have Dr. Ilya Singech from the Stem Cell Translation Laboratory at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, also known as NCATS. He's on the podcast to talk about his research on industrial scale cellular engineering for regenerative medicine, characterization of cell type identities, and developmental states and disease modeling and neurological and psychiatric disorders. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and stem cell news that's coming right up. But first, before we dive into it, we wanted to talk a little bit about EICCR 2022 meeting, which is actually coming up pretty soon next year, and it's going to be in person and also virtual uh, June 15th to 18th in San Francisco. And actually, Dalen and I are we're pretty hyped about attending. I was on the website the other day and I saw that abstract submissions are actually open. So we got to think about getting things in and you know sending things in so you can meet that February 9th deadline for selecting abstracts. And actually, I really wanted to encourage trainees in the field to participate in the meeting. It's a fantastic meeting for trainees. I've attended many years in the running. Uh, it's a great way to so showcase your, your research and you know do some networking too, meet some collaborators, perhaps even get hired down the road. You know, who knows? You know, it's a good place to, to meet folks, right? So there are also, of course, travel and merit awards available to trainees. So definitely looking forward to it. Can't wait to attend. Yes, that's going to be great. I can't wait to get back in person. I mean, it was great the way they adjusted, though, in the last couple of meetings. Um, I remember last year, the virtual meeting that we covered, the big news was all about these blastoids, right? It's all about uh, these new models of embryo development, pre-implantation. And here we're going to start the roundup with a bit of a continuation of that theme Again, Nicholas Rivron, who's at the IMBA, he's come back with a monumental kind of earth-shaking story here. It, it, it resonates on many levels, not just scientific. It was, I don't know if it was in the news, but it should have been. Um, everyone in science, I think, is aware of this. Uh, so we all know the story with blastoids, right? They're a completely in vitro derived model of blastocysts just generated from the three constituent primary cell types that are present in a blastocyst stage, right? Primitive endoderm, trophectoderm, and the epiblast, um, our inner cell mass. And the, in the meeting, uh, it was big news because multiple groups, uh, Rivron among them, had, had come out with stories showing that you could make these blastoids of different types, different names, but it was essentially the same idea. But um, you know, around that time, there's also a little bit of a controversy about whether or not these blastoids or equivalents were really uh, uh, faithful models of blastocysts. Um, and specifically because it seemed like in at least uh, some of the models, the trophectoderm, putative trophectoderm cells looked a lot more like amnion, a stage that's much later, not much later, but significantly later in development and doesn't really uh, align with uh, primitive endoderm and the inner cell mass epiblast at that stage. So the, the, the I guess, debate uh, went forward and the challenge was to sh really show um, a, a blastoid that was akin to a native blastocyst. And that's what Rivron did here, uh, here, the long and short of it. Uh, a little bit of the details in terms of how he did it, how it was different from the previous methods, key here, was this triple inhibition, right? Because um, peripheral cells uh, at the tro trophectoderm it emerges from peripheral cells of a more or less stage embryo by inhibiting the hippo pathway. Um, so that was one component that he added in. And also native uh, or naive human pluripotent stem cells, uh, they form trophectoderm efficiently uh, by inhibiting TGF beta and ERK. So that was a kind of key critical element here in order to avoid that amnion derivative to really get bona fide trophectoderm. The culture started with this triple inhibition 
of HIPPO, ERK, and TGF beta, and that was combined with LIF um, and the ROC inhibitor uh, that we're going to talk about uh, a little bit later on the show. Um, and, you know, that was it. Uh, that simple recipe, and that's what's so amazing about this to me is how scalable it was, um, was able to generate these blastoids with high efficiency over 70%. And key here is that of those 70% of the attempts that formed blastoids, more than 97% of them, so pretty much all of them, uh, had all of the three founding lineages in them. And that was verified using single cell seq uh, and comparison of, and this was key, they compared these iblastoids to bona fide blastocysts and then in vitro cultured blastocysts, and then a gastrulation stage embryo. You know, we just uh, covered this gastrula stage single cell seek story that made a whole paper in Nature here. Rubron is just using it as a reference. Um, and what they showed here critically is that the eye blastoids looked a lot more, or equivalent really, to the blastocyst stage embryo. So they really address that issue of these amnion or later stage cells not aligning. Um, although they did find in less than 3% of all the sequence cells, these amnion cells did exist. So they did show that this tendency did exist, although they were able to kind of obviate it. Um, and here was really another big deal experiment, I think that was a watershed, is that they used uh, endometrial organoids here. So this is stuff, that, uh, work that's recently published in the last few years, making endometrial organoids from primary endometrial tissue. And here they, they made them open-faced. So they made the organ and then opened it up, uh, put it into monolayer culture, and then stimulated it um, in order to make it into a receptive phase by stimulating with estrogen um, and uh, progesterone and uh, wind signaling antagonists. And they were able to, and cyclic AMP as well, and they were able to get the endometrium to this phase of receptivity, then showed that these blastoids would adhere in a specific polar fashion um, and undergo kind of analogs of implantation. Here's the big kind of uh, showcase result, I guess, which scientifically is not as uh, big a deal as uh, maybe the news would make it, but they, they actually looked at the chorionic uh, gonadotropin, to, it gave a pregnancy test essentially um, to show that the, the processes that follow from implantation at the native uterus were indeed uh, recapitulated. They got this chorionic gonadotropin beta um, using ELISA. So effectively showed that they got implantation of a blastocyst that was in completely cell-derived. So, you know, I, it's a big deal, I think, um, for the obvious reasons, scary reasons, uh, and maybe we'll talk about that in a sec, uh, Arun, but as the author stated, the real key here is that they were able to show that they made blastoids that morphologically resembled a bona fide human blastocyst generated the three lineages with transcriptomic signatures that were a good, perfect match, essentially, um, and that at approximated the same pace of blastocyst development and subsequent implantation. Um, and, and this is really the purpose of this is, you know, I, I love this line. I'm going to just read it verbatim at the end of the discussion. Considering, quote, considering the proportionality, parentheses, balancing the benefits and harms, uh, close parentheses, and subsidiarity, parentheses, pursuing goals using the morally least problematic means, close parentheses, of human embryology, blastoids represent an ethical opportunity to complement research using embryos. And I really applaud the, 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 the reach of this paper, uh, the conservative nature and, of, of the endpoints, and you know the science, of course, but um, also I think the, the way in which uh, the, the, the story was told and phrased in order to really stay within the limits of, of what we've been talking about uh, at the meeting and, and before and since about the, maybe the ethical boundaries that we're skirting here, or not skirting, but pushing, um, and how that may be uh, done in a conservative way. Arun, talk to me. Yeah, I think this is perhaps one of, if not the most important paper in the field from this year for obvious reasons. Obviously, the the science is incredible. The applications are incredible. The And it, certainly, there's the ethical considerations too, which you have to think about any time you're modeling early human development in a dish this way. I think the Raron lab has done, as you mentioned, a great job at 
appropriately addressing some of the concerns as, associated with this work. Um, but <laughs> something you alluded to in the very beginning, yes, this has gotten a lot, a lot of press coverage uh, across the board. Even my parents sent me some news articles about this. And so that really tells you something. Um, they're not in tune with the stem cell field at all. But I mean, I'm just going to focus on the science here. There's so much cool stuff to dissect here. Just how they actually made these blastoids is is really neat. These little uh, pattern hydrogels that they're actually growing these blastoids on and really forcing them to aggregate and to grow in this spherical format. Um, perhaps that contributed to the overall efficiency of the process. They actually show that across multiple uh, cell lines, multiple pluripotent stem cell lines, they, they got very efficient differentiation, 70%. I think that was the, the number that they quoted. So that's always great to see that the protocol is really reproducible in that way. The endometrial organoids and the utilization of those is also phenomenal. It makes a lot of sense. You're growing this endometrial tissue ex vivo. Initially, I, you know, I just thought they explanted some, uh, you know, true human endometrial tissue and just, you know, grew it in a, in a dish, but they actually took the time to create the organoids from it and then sort of two dimensionalize them to actually have that layer so that the, the blastoids could actually implant, which is of course the other huge part of this. That's really cool to, to, to show. I was talking to a, a mutual colleague that we have, a friend who is an IVF doc, and uh, she was really excited about this. She was a little nervous about the downstream application, but we also agreed that I don't think this is going to be implanted in humans anytime soon. I think, you know, the it's, I don't know if it's going to work in terms of if you actually put these things in people or you know, we're not obviously not suggesting we do that, mm -hmm. but I think there's a lot of limitations associated with this particular technology. It's not perfect. But one thing that she did bring up was the utility of these things for screening purposes. So apparently, and you can, you can talk to me about this, I'm sure you know, better than I can. I, I, this is your area of expertise. But when it comes to finding the right media, the culture conditions for IVF and actually growing embryos in vitro for IVF purposes, perhaps this could be really useful as a high throughput screening platform to, to identify better culture conditions for IVF. So she was really excited about that. But yeah, a lot to dissect here. Um, this is perhaps my favorite paper of the year for, for multiple, multiple reasons. Yes. I mean, an amazing story again. And the, uh, to your point about the screening, when you look at the supplemental video here, uh, it's, it's right there, plain to see, you see the whole, uh, aggregate micro well array and there's hundreds of, uh, embryos or sorry, blastoids, uh, all forming all in concert. Perfect. You know? Uh, so, this is robust. And the idea that this is going to be used for screening is clearly, it's not far away. The idea that this is going to be used for reproduction is very, very far away. And I, I would venture that given the, the timing of, of mouse reproduction and, and in utero development, uh, kind of taking these same methods, applying them to a mouse and seeing if it would actually implant um, and form a, a, a normal conceptus, it can't be uh, long now before we at least test to see whether or not it'll be successful. I think probably it's not so simple as making something that looks and, you know, rolls and attaches like a, a blastocyst. Um, there may be something to do with the epigenome or something like that. But again, I just want to circle back to finish to, to how, how uh, careful uh, and, you know, brilliant clearly, but also uh, savvy, the savvy it takes and and being able to limit yourself, it's tough. Um, they, they stopped even short of what the ISSCR guidelines had revised, you know, to, to include. So they went even, you know, stopped at around a developmental stage short of 14. And, and the ISSCR has kind of loosened those guidelines. So I think they're really taking a stepwise approach. And I, I applaud them for that. It's, it's a really smart, smart way to go about this. Absolutely. It's a watershed moment and a watershed paper. I think a really tremendous work from the Rome lab. And actually moving on to another area that's become quite a hotbed of pop culture, not pop culture, but popular news uh, in the stem cell field, which is, you know, of course, using stem cells and stem cell derived beta cells for uh, treating type one diabetes. This has been 
a huge hope in the field for many, many years now. There was, a, of course, an article in the New York Times uh, highlighting the work of um, Doug Melton over there at Harvard, which uh, was a great piece as well. I really encourage everybody to check it out. And this is a clinical and translational report coming from Cell Stem Cell. It's a another sort of a, a landmark study, really. It's the results from a um, open label first in human phase one, two study. You know, this is safety and efficacy uh, from folks working with Viacite, you know, these encapsulated uh, stem cell derived pancreatic endodermal cells, which are implanted in non immunoprotective devices, these Viacite devices for the treatment of type one diabetes. That's a really important specification, really important criteria uh, that I have to mention here. This is looking at type one, not type two, which is of course, you know, much broader in scope, but type one, the really sometimes lethal genetic version of diabetes. So they're actually reporting on the analysis of the uh, one-year data from the first cohort of 15 people who actually received this, uh, this device, this implanted, implanted device. It's a single trial site that's important to, to note here. Uh, they received this subcutaneous implantation of these cell products combined with immunopres- immunosuppression. Importantly, you know, there weren't a lot of adverse reactions from the immunosuppression itself. There were, there were a couple that they noted here uh, and the, the implants were pretty well tolerated. They actually, you know, importantly didn't show teratoma formation, which you got to show from any stem cell derived products, no severe graft related adverse events. And after implantation, this is the important part. Patients actually increased their fasting C-peptide levels and increase their glucose responsive C-peptide levels. You know, of course this precursor to insulin, which is the C-peptide and developed a a meal stimulated C-peptide secretion. So perhaps these graphs are responding to uh, food being consumed and are secreting insulin appropriately. So there, as I mentioned, there are some immunosuppression related reactions and then results, but nothing too severe it seems like. And then they actually explanted these graphs and confirmed that they're actually cells with a mature beta cell phenotype that are immunoreactive for insulin uh, and uh, they are functional. So that's exciting to see. So it's a, it's a paper in cell stem cell that actually came out hand in hand with another report in, in uh, cell reports medicine. And the important thing here, it's the first reported evidence of meal regulated insulin secretion by differentiated stem cell populations in, in people. Okay. It's been a a long time to try to get to this point, but this is another somewhat of a a landmark study, in my opinion, you know, we're able to show that, yes, perhaps these things are having the appropriate effect in actually secreting C-peptide when they should. Now, there are a lot of limitations, and I can get to that, but I really want to get to your thoughts on this first, Alan. (laughs) Well, um, I, I think this is great. And it's, I don't know, is it a coincidence that this, the, the mountain story and this story, and I will say this, unlike the mountain story is robust, right? I mean, it's got, it's a clinical trial, well-designed, um, high end relative to one, which was the, what the New York Times story is about. If not, if the result wasn't as glorious, at least uh, I think the, the incremental advance here is profound. And um, I, I will say, I think, that my questions remain, you know, this is kind of the Viacite uh, 2.0, as far as I understand, because the initial one, they were worried about vasculature. And so this has like channels. Um, so there's more of an interface so that vascular uh, cells can, can um, invade and, and kind of provide some, some support there to the graft. Um, but the same question I think remains from the early uh, trials with Viacite. I think that helped actually, honestly, the, the second iteration in terms of the viability and function of the grass. But I still wonder about the immune suppression because uh, the whole promise of these encapsulated devices, I thought, was that they could be kind of off the shelf products. So I think we still have to, to, to work toward that. But, you know, th- these technologies that run in parallel, essentially, maybe these kind of like immune uh, evading, uh, founder lines that may be used with the MHC knocked out, like that would totally address it. And we may be able to get around the, um, immunosuppression. The only question I have really regarding that immunosuppression is if it's not the actual device itself, because that was the question that came up a lot with the early iteration of the bias site. If there wasn't any kind of immune, um, uh, antigen there to respond to, 
because the encapsulation, why were you getting fibrosis on these uh, devices? And I wonder if maybe it's not just some more passive instead of targeted immunity that uh, resulting from inflammation of the implant. But uh, these are all questions I think that'll be worked out. This is a great uh, step forward for, for everyone out there that, that is affected by diabetes. Yeah, this is the, this, these are early stage results. And in any clinical trial, this is an important milestone, the, the safety and the early stage efficacy. And the next step is, you know, presumably to, to scale things up. Um, it, it is a, it's a good pilot study. I, I think I, like I mentioned, I wanted to highlight some limitations. The big one, there's no specific control group here. And it's, I guess, tough to have a control group in the situation. And the interventions were also not, you know, blinded, you know, that that's, that's also another really important consideration here. So uh, there are limitations. And I think that's a result of the design of the study and the design of, you know, actually getting the implant of these things into people. Uh, the other thing are the long-term clinical outcomes. Those still need to be more well-established. Like, yes, yeah, secretion of C-protein, C-peptide is great, but is that enough to actually ameliorate and reduce the overall function and the overall phenotype of the type 1 diabetes? And that's, that's really the next step here. So this is early. This is preliminary. This is a phase one, early two clinical trial, but promising. Yeah, I mean, this, this is stem cell derived products in people, Arun. Isn't it amazing? I mean, we live in such a glorious time to be watching these things and watching the progress. Um, you know, when our kids are our age, they'll take it all for granted. Those lucky sons of. Anyway, uh, you know, we're talking about diabetes here. It's something I think about around the holidays with all the consumption. But the other thing I think about counterintuitively is saliva. And that really sprung to mind when I was reading this story, because can you imagine not having saliva with the dry ass turkey that my mm. father-in-law made? Oh my goodness, it would have never gotten off the ground. <laughs> but, you know, on a more serious note, uh, zero stomia, which is a fancy way of saying dry mouth. It's a real big deal, um, really uh, related to radiotherapy. You know, there's about half a million people worldwide a year that uh, get radiotherapy, um, well, are diagnosed every year, half a million for head and neck cancers. Um, and radiotherapy is really the best, well, one of the best ways of treating it. It really increases the survival rate. Um, but of course, with every chemo, there's always the downside. In this case, it's a high probability of developing this uh, radiation toxicity in the salivary glands that results in hyposalivation and xerostomia or dry mouth which I can imagine is like, talk about, you know, one of the, the seven circles of hell, just it's, it's a, and maybe not life-threatening, but certainly sounds miserable and uh, an unmet need. Um, so just a little background briefly, the salivary gland epithelium is composed of two cell types. There's a secretary, secretory acinar cells, they make the saliva, and then there's a ductal cells that transport it, right? Um, and these different cells have different responses to ionizing radiation because the acinar compartment uh, is, you know, the secretory one. It's really mitotically active and it's thought to maintain homeostasis and it's thought to mediate regeneration following radiation damage because it's so mitotically active. Um, but of course that's limited, you know, multiple rounds of radiation, they kind of you know, peter out and then you have eventual loss of this whole acinar compartment. Now on the other side, you have the ductal compartment and those are thought to be relatively quiescent. Um, and there's been lineage for, they're really because they're quiescent, they're robust and they're, they can resist radiation induced damage. But the lineage tracing studies that have been done in, in adult mice, um, most of them, I think, point toward, from what I glean, point towards this kind of lineage, unipotent, lineage restricted uh, capacity in the, the ductal cells. But there's some other studies that suggest maybe that they are plastic, that they can give rise to the acinar, the secretory cells, right? So, this question remains, um, and uh, it's relevant just because you want to know what gland or what component of the niche there you should spare or you should supplement if you're trying to avoid this uh, condition following the radiotherapy for head and neck cancer. So to this end, Robert Coppest, who's at, I think that's how you say his name, my apologies if not, um, who's at the University of Gro Groningen in uh, the Netherlands, uh, his group they uh, were looking into YAP. Okay, so YAP signaling briefly. YAP 
it's emerged in, you know, generally speaking, it's key for tissue growth and regeneration of various organs, and it's tightly controlled by hippo, right? So when they saw this regenerative process going on, they thought yap, they thought hippo, uh, and they asked whether or not yap had a role in the salivary, salivary gland regeneration. Um, and indeed, it had more than just a role, it had a major role. Uh, so activation of hippo, uh, led to nuclear translocation of YAP, which you know causes uh, the transcriptional targets to get off the ground. Um, and the they looked in in the context in mice in context of uh, sal salivary gland injury. Also here in organoids, you know we got to have an organoid story. So they looked at some organoids, um, and they found that YAP uh, it it following uh, local uh, injury. YAP had no effect on the, the acinar cells. So the saliva, saliva producing cells, it had no effect. But what it did do is it, it caused nuclear accumulation in the ductal cells and it caused proliferation of these ductal cells. Remember, these are the cells that were thought to be the quiescent ones that were unipotent. So in reality, these cells are not unipotent and they have some plasticity and can, and can regenerate the entire salivary gland, including the acinar cells. And also they showed that overexpressing YAP or forcing translocation of YAP, um, you would increase the capacity of not just mouse, but also human salivary glands. And this includes human cells that had been irradiated um, and uh, were formed into organoids in vitro. So I think, you know, I started with the jokes uh, about, you know, Thanksgiving and saliva. But like, for me, this is such a, a, a great story because it, it, it's an unmet need that here there's an actual translatable therapy here. You know, I don't know how, how easy it is to apply hippo and yap in a specific way. But at the very least, I think it's the knowledge that you can spare this uh, ductal component um, that's kind of slow growing. And that might be kind of a, a regenerative uh, repository for the salivary glands in these patients with head and neck cancers who are suffering enough, for God's sakes, let them have some delicious meals. <laughs> it's, it's a quality of life story and something that you don't really think about a lot when it comes to cancer treatment, but I can appreciate how important this would be, you know, to, to have an appropriate functioning of your salivary glands. I, I will say, as you alluded to, Hippo YAP signaling is a tremendously powerful signaling pathway, very, very powerful when it comes to driving cell proliferation. And we've talked it, about it a lot on the show and its utility in different tissue types and really driving some pretty incredible proliferation phenotypes. The, the paper, of course, says that the cardiac biologist that comes to me, there's this one a few years ago where hyperactivation of hippo yap in, in mouse hearts was able to like double the size of the hearts or something like that. It was, it was wild. And even referring back to the, the first paper in our roundup today from the Ron lab, the, the blastoid paper, hippo yap signaling is also important there in that context and the early developmental context too. So I think it's, it's really cool to show the, the power of this pathway and in, in regulating these cells, but for translation, I, I think, there's still a lot of work that has to happen here to really fine tune hippo yap signaling because it is it is a really strong signaling pathway. That's a fair point, but uh, you didn't you didn't taste this turkey, Arun. I mean, I might take a little <laughs> guess lateral not. damage if I could get my <laughs> salivary glands back. But I mean, in all seriousness, I think you're right. Um, I'll just circle back. I think the understanding is is enough it's half the battle right knowing uh what the reality of the regenerative niche there is in the salivary gland i think that gets you halfway and then the therapeutic targeting in the context of, of radiotherapy is is the other half of the story um but you know more than anything i just love to see a story that comes out of an unrecognized niche right you know blastoids and pluripotent stems a lot of people talking about that you know, a lot of people are talking about what you're about to talk about, a lot of people looking into it. So it's nice for me, diabetes, same thing. It's nice for me to see these little niche stories. I like to, to elevate them a little bit. You know what I mean? Or yeah, I got you. I got you. And for, I guess for the trainees out there, this is an important note, something to consider. You may not have thought about this particular niche, but there are a lot of unmet needs out there, unmet medical needs that you may not be thinking about and may not be on the tip of your tongue, right? 
Well, shifting gears to something that is quite popular these days and is not as niche anymore, of course, is organoids and IPSC derived organoids. This is coming from Todd McDevitt's lab. And I think he's actually moving on to sauna biotherapeutics, which is interesting. I, that's pretty cool. Congratulations to Dr. McDevitt. Uh, this is a paper that's been in the works. It's a uh, title called Co-Emergence of Cardiac and Gut Tissues Promoting Cardiomyocyte Maturation Within Human iPSC-Derived Organoids. I think we actually covered parts of this maybe at ISCR or one of the other meetings that we had covered. Uh, so this has been in the works for, for a little while. First author here is Anna C. Silva. And we're talking about crosstalk. We're talking about signaling crosstalk, paracrine signaling crosstalk in, in development. And this is something that's, uh, of course, very important, as we have shown throughout the years, and even with some of the new model systems that are coming out, the gastroloids, the blastoids that we talked about today, we're getting a better understanding about how paracrine signaling is impacting the development of different tissue types. And here they're focusing on gut and heart. There, I guess there's a few different ways you can approach this. One is the, um, the approach that uh, uh, Sergio Pasca takes. Of course, Sergio Pasca, our, our friend over in, at Stanford, who's been on the show a few times, uh, he's got the assembloid based approach where you combine different tissue types to sort of get a better understanding of these paracrine signaling and these, uh, the impact of different tissue types on adjacent tissue types. But here they're looking at a, a more of a natural in vitro organoid differentiation that's actually uh, co-differentiating cardiac and gut tissues. So you're able to model cardiac development and cardiac maturation with this gut context right next to it. Okay. So they show that the presence of this endodermal tissue, gut slash intestine in these co-differentiated organoids actually contributes to the maturation of cardiac tissue. So there are certain features that you would only find after heart tube formation, like cardiomyocyte expansion, compartmentalization, importantly, enrichment of the atrial and nodal cells, myocardial compaction, uh, overall functional maturation that they're only getting in the context of these gut slash heart organoids and not only in the, the cardiac organoids. Okay. So it's able to show the importance of cooperative tissues, right? The importance of tissue cooperation in generating these mature cardiac cell types. Perhaps there's other applications of this as well. Um, so taking multiple different germ lineages within a single organoid model. That's the important thing here. You've got your endoderm, you've got your mesoderm co-differentiating in a single organoid as opposed to kind of the assembly based approach. And I think it's a, it's a nice step towards understanding these multi-tissue interactions that of course are pervasive and, you know, they contribute to so many different aspects of development, right? We talked about the impact of different tissue types on brain development and in, and blood development. There, nothing ever functions in isolation, even though sometimes in a cell culture dish that might be the case, but perhaps this is a, a nice uh, counter argument to that, to show that perhaps if you want to best study development, you gotta study these different uh, germ layers and the cells derived from different germ layers at the same time. I think it's a, it's a neat approach. This is so cool. I, I mean, I, I have to ask, do we have a new kind of oid here, my man? I think I, I'm, I'm putting it out there. I'm calling it a cooperoid. All right. Co put, put like it, that. Mint that. All right. I want to see that in press. And then my, I'll know my mission in life is complete. This is uh, on the flip side of like the, the, the Rivron story on the front end where it's like, okay, you take this really, you know, a refined cocktail that you've, you know, vetted and a lot of biology went into understanding, but like when you apply it, it's simple and robust versus, in short, <laughs> versus this. I look at these studies and I, I really am, am sympathetic um, to you guys who do these organize these long-term cultures. I mean, it's so amazing. Day 100 plus, you know, we're talking about years uh, sometimes to complete an experiment. Same story uh, with Pasca and, uh, and the assembloids and all the neural uh, organoids and anybody who works in, in this kind of space. Uh, it's very impressive the, the patience it takes and the precision, I, I would guess, to get a consistent result, um, especially as you start to incorporate more variables, right? I, I never thought I'd see the day that you could get reproducible and order differentiation from these cultures that, you know, when you put them in, in, a, in a tissue alone, they form these teratoma masses. So 
I think that it really speaks to how how well um, how far we've come uh, and and how how close we are to really amazing practical solutions uh, toward making you know at least organ enlages I think uh, or organ rudiments that may be clinically and, and useful certainly biologically useful for insight but I think really maybe clinical, clinically applicable even and in, in, in shorter than I would have guessed, I'll say at least that. Yeah, I think your point of reproducibility is a really important one. Um, that's been a limitation of the organoid field for sure when it comes to the heterogeneity of these things and how reproducible some of these differentiation protocols actually are. But if you even consider the blastoid as an organoid, the reproducibility of both of these papers that we're demonstrating, the first one and the last one that we're talking about now, has been pretty good. With the blastoids, it's up to 70 plus percent uh, blastoids during your differentiation process. And part of it has to do with incorporating those really cool uh, tissue engineering based approaches to perhaps make these things more reproducible, like in the blastoid paper, the hydrogel patterning, I uh, really recommend taking a look at that paper. That's still on my mind. It's just some of the figures and videos in that blastoid paper are just absolutely so beautiful. So, you know, coming back to this one, the co-cultured heart and uh, gut differentiation, one interesting and it's quite an amusing limitation of this paper was because these things are almost so chunky and so dense and full of cells they had some trouble apparently imaging them because they were just so thick <laughs> perhaps that's a it's a unique limitation with organoids but you're right i mean you're able to to grow these things for months potentially years uh to to study some of these really cool developmental processes yeah who says we're not going to be able to make a heart in vitro i mean i might have said that at some point but i'm i'm gonna go back and scrub that from the internet um, you know, the, all these therapies for me today have really uh, underscored how close we are to translation of uh, cell-based products from pluripotent stem cells. And, you know, one of the, the leaders in that field, and it's, I think it's so great that he's at the NIH, is Ilya Singetch, who we're going to talk to in just a minute. But before we get to that, uh, I have a quick message from Stem Cell Technologies and it's relevant here, you know, because you guys listening to this show may be the authors of the next big paper, taking human pluripotent stem cells to new heights. So get started with MTs or media. Take your human pluripotent stem cell cultures further with MTs or plus from stem cell technologies, the most widely published medium for feeder free human ES and IPS cell maintenance. It's now formulated for enhanced performance and versatility MTs or plus reduces medium acidosis for more stable cultures all weekend long. To learn more, visit www.stemcell.com slash MTs or plus. All right, everybody. We have with us today, joining us from the NIH, a special guest, Dr. Ilyas Singech, who is the director of the Stem Cell Translation Laboratory at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences otherwise known as NCATS at the NIH. Dr. Singetch uses human-induced pluripotent stem cells as a model system and is interested in industrial-scale cellular engineering for regenerative medicine, characterization of cell type identities, and developmental states in disease modeling of neurological and psychiatric disorders. He's doing a lot of things over there at the NIH. Dr. Singetch, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. Yeah, it's good to see you again, Dr. Singetch. And we'll start with a, a broad question. Of course, you're over there at NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. And you've got a focused interest in using pluripotent stem cells for really industrial scale manufacturing, which I think is kind of an ultimate goal in the stem cell field and the cell therapy field. So as the leader of a pretty new group at the NIH focused on this area, Tell us what you actually hope to accomplish through your role and in particular, why you chose to start your laboratory at NCATS as opposed to maybe a more traditional academic center. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, to give you a little bit of background, what we're trying to accomplish at um, the National Center for Advancing Translation Sciences. So I joined um, NIH around um, six years ago, essentially. Um, so funded through a special program um, supported by the office of the uh, NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins. 
um, with the specific mission of trying to help bring the iPSL technology closer to clinical applications. Um, so this is a very broad mission. Um, and, and, and there were certain areas that we early on identified together as being critical for IPSL translation. So such as um, quality control and safety standards, which has been a longstanding problem in the field even before iPS cells were generated. Uh, so speaking of uh, embryonic stem cells as an example. Um, also the question of reproducibility um, so that we can improve cell differentiation as a process that is well controlled. Um, and then also better characterization of the cells that we generate uh, in, the, in a stepwise fashion trying to emulate uh, developmental biology. And also um, lastly, identifying new small molecules so that can help with uh, reducing cost, improving overall rigor in developing these protocols. So altogether, those are the four main areas that initially were found to be you know, of, of great relevance for IPS cell translation. And then uh, more recently, since 2018, uh, we also became part of the um, a program that's called uh, HEAL Initiative. Uh, HEAL stands for helping to end addiction long-term. So this is a program that was started in response to the um, opioid crisis that you're probably aware of in this country. Uh, so using IPS cells, trying to develop um, new pain drugs so we can make uh, nociceptors as an example and use these cells for um, uh, pain drug development. And then also lastly, um, an area of interest is um, addressing public health emergencies. Um, so we have some work um, around Zika virus and, and um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, and also some interest in, in rare diseases as well. So it's kind of a broad portfolio of things we're doing currently, but initially started really around the question of IPS cell translation. What needs to be done? What are the major um, obstacles or hurdles that uh, we can overcome and, and, and really help do this in a collaborative fashion? And, and everything we're doing at NCATS um, is, is really based on collaboration and then sharing information broadly with the public so that everyone can benefit from you know, these new knowledge and, and insights. Yeah, I mean, you said it there, translation is the key and the point of emphasis. And for me, I mean, it's not, I wouldn't say irony, because everything that ever, pretty much everything that ever makes it into clinical practice comes through the NIH, right? It's such a behemoth of a funding body, um, almost by necessity, it has to play some part. Um, but, you know, there's some symmetry there for me, because I started grad school right after uh, Jamie Thompson first derived human embryonic stem cells, but right before, uh, so a lot of enthusiasm and then, you know, throwing cold water on that was the, the Bush era uh, administration uh, regulations that kind of hamstrung the federal funding apparatus. Um, so for me, as I said, there's this agreeable symmetry to the NIH having a major foothold here in the translation of pluripotent stem cell based therapies here only two decades later. later. And of course, as I said, the NIH was never against pluripotent stem cells uh, or their applications per se, but of course, politics plays a role, right? Uh, it's a federally funded research. Um, so with that in mind, I have to ask, is there any consideration of like the political headwinds in your, I guess you can only speak for your lab, but maybe you have some insight into the NIH at large, other NIH labs. Um, you know, having spanned three administrations there since you started six years ago, and in that really spanned these really radical ideological shifts. Do you think politics has uh, any, if if not a disproportionate um, influence on science, uh, the practice of science within the NIH? And if not, is it because the scientists by intent have to kind of put aside politics? Or is it just by nature that the scientists there and the science transcends uh, political influence? What are, your, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, very complex question. Um, so, so definitely you need regulation and, and, and follow you know, the laws. Um, so I think, so this is something that NIH is obviously um, 
you know, very meticulous and careful about, um, and also to communicate this to the to the broader audience. Um, so, so the, the problem initially, as you know, was was derivation of of uh, new cell lines from uh, embryos. Um, so, with the advent of the the iPS cell technology, I think the uh, the challenges around you know the ethical questions have been um, essentially they're no longer you know preventing us from working with um, induced pluripotent stem cells. So, so this is kind of the breakthrough in that space um, helps us to circumvent the ethical issues around generating new cell lines from embryos. Um, so in that regard, um, NIH has seen the, the tremendous opportunity here that iPS cell research uh, should be funded and, and, and across the different institute, institutes and centers at NIH, as you know, there's um, a tremendous um, su uh, support and funding of um, iPS cell research as well as adult stem cells as well. Um, so in that regard, I think the, the you know, old questions are kind of no longer preventing us from making real progress using induced purple and stem cell technology. Um, I, I would leave it at that. Uh, so as, as things can um, change, as, as science is making progress, um, but, but I think we all agree that we really need regulation and um, you know, an ethical framework uh, going forward. And this is you know, exactly what NIH can, can uh, provide here. Yeah, it's part of the fun and part of the excitement of working in a field that's at the cutting edge is you have some of these issues and these ethical concerns that we get to discuss as a community and um, as a scientific body. So I, it's certainly not going away. And it's you know good to see that you're not necessarily shying away from answering some of these questions. But bringing it back a little bit to the biomanufacturing and the industrial scale manufacturing that you're talking about, your, your group actually just published a paper or was about to publish a paper in stem cell reports, which you actually had the, uh, you were actually very kind enough to forward us that preprint. And it's, it's made the cover for the December issue of stem cell reports. So congrats on that, by the way. Um, it's, it's describing your lab's efforts for this idea of standardized industrial scale biomanufacturing, which is critical. It's critical for developing new stem cell based therapeutics. And standardization is a topic that's come up a lot in stem cell biology, biomanufacturing in particular. And even now, decades later, it's still a major hurdle in this field. In the example of stem cell differentiation, which is near and dear to, to my heart, it's almost like every lab has a slightly different methodology or differentiation approach to create a particular stem cell derived cell of interest. And while it might not be as critical in academia, standardization is Utter, utterly important, extremely important in industrial and clinical applications, as we all know. So tell us a little bit more about this work, the stem cell reports paper that's in the works. And in particular, what are some of the most important remaining barriers for actually standardizing stem cell production and differentiation too? Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Arun. Um, yeah, it's great to see this paper coming out. Um, so. What we tried to do early on when we started the stem cell translation laboratory is think really about efficiency. And, and, and as you said, standardization is really going hand in hand with this effort, trying to translate the technology. Um, so early on, we decided we want more robotic automated um, approaches. Um, and, and we're using this platform um, it's called the Compact Select T. Um, so it allows us to actually culture uh, 90 different iPS cell lines in parallel, um, which in, in increases the throughput as we have many different ongoing collaborations and in-house projects. Um, you, you simply require this type of uh, scalability. So early on, we wanted to first address the question, is this really possible? So knowing how challenging stem cell culture in general is. So can we really make this decision, demonstrate feasibility, and then also provide a very detailed um, comparison to manual cell culture as, as the, the standard in the field? 
And it, it turned out, yes, it is, it is feasible. Um, we can generate uh, in, in just a, in a few days. One example uh, we're providing in this paper in just uh, 12 days, we can generate over 9 billion IPS cell lines and those can be cryopreserved um, or um, basically carrying out multi-lineage differentiation. So in this paper, it's proof of principle, we're showing um, generation of neurons, cardiomyocytes and, and uh, hepatocytes. And, and you can do this again in a scale up or scale down fashion that would also allow um, to subject yourself directly to high throughput screening. So drug discovery is an, is an important area of interest. So, um, so we're hoping that these type of studies can uh, really inspire the field. Um, and, and certainly going forward, as we want to translate, having the um, cellular product at, at high quality um, and not being restricted by cell numbers is I think absolutely critical um, to generate these um, cell therapies. So, so allergenic or in an autologous fashion. So in either way, either way you, you need cells and, and, and large number of cells. Um, yeah, it is, it is hopefully useful uh, to the field. Um, and, and I can envision that uh, companies um, and other um, entities that are interested in translating the technology will find this kind of an you know useful approach to um, also take out the guesswork out of um, the procedure itself. So process development um, is, is obviously very important as you develop your product. And um, overall, it takes out, um, uh, I would say, the variability. So you're less investigator um, dependent. So you can do this um, in a more consistent and rigorous fashion. And, and we have some yeah, examples in the paper highlighting how this is actually feasible. So you have less investigator bias. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we're all circling around this idea and it's been coming up in a lot of our conversations recently that we're, we're on the cusp of translation here. We're about to get cells into people. Um, and in order to do that, we really have to prepare, right? In terms of rigor, in terms of scale. Um, and there was big news recently, uh, a lot of outlets, including the New York Times, with the kind of outside success of this early stage trial of pancreatic beta cells, um, you know, Doug Melton's group and SAMA, which was ultimately bought by Vertex, they had this one early trial, which was really just safety as an endpoint. And, you know, it's a big story in the Times, of course, there's a lot of narrative there. But the bottom line is this patient has pretty much full glucose tolerance there um, and is living a normal life again. So it really underscores how close we are to really mass dissemination of these cell-based products. But a sticking point there at the end was the expense, right? This is not cheap and, and is, as Melton estimated, $50 million over the course, which is not a lot really, but $50 million of federal funds is roughly has gone to his development and Vertex didn't buy this for no reason, right? They're hoping to capitalize and the treatment's gonna be very expensive, it's expected. And of course, one of the major endpoints for your work is the small molecules and the standardization and, and making it cheaper, right? But it seems like there's so much apparatus involved in getting these cells into patient that it's hardly reasonable that it's gonna be, I don't know, cheap. Uh, so what, what, what do you have to say about that? I mean, we're so close, but how can we get these treatments into regular people? Yeah, excellent point. Um, I think this is a wonderful example of um, what stem cells can eventually achieve um, for, for biomedical research and then ultimately therapies. I, I, I really enjoyed the, the article that you just mentioned as well. So hopefully, yeah, this, this can be quickly um, expanded and, and used for many other patients. Um, so, so the question about reimbursement, um, so how much to invest, how much do you get um, in return? I think this is a question that really has to be uh, discussed and developed together with uh, different groups. So not just scientists, um, uh, obviously, you know, business people, healthcare providers, you know, doctors, surgeons who have eventually apply this type of therapy. 
Um, I think this is still a new area um, and, and, and almost yeah, experimental as we, as we learn that this is now becoming reality. Um, yeah, it is possible that, that we maybe have to really think about new ways of um, financing these kind of treatments. Um, so, so a lot of creative uh, discussions, I would say, are, are needed here. And um, so the treatment or the expenses for treating you know, type 1 diabetes might be quite different than treating um, patients with Parkinson's disease, right? It, it is also difficult to do a you know, direct comparison here. Um, so yeah, it, it is an area that requires a lot more you know, discussions um, and, and, and having a price tag, um, you know, these predictions, these business models around this. Uh, so it's not my area of expertise, but I think as these proof of principle type of studies demonstrate that it is feasible. And, um, you know, the things we are trying to contribute that these protocols can be uh, made cheaper by replacing, for instance, recombinant proteins using small molecules, you can bring costs down. So this is really part of the overall uh, equation we are working on. Uh, but yeah, very uh, encouraging uh, uh, news. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's, I think, like you mentioned at the end there, it's part of the reason why small molecules are you know, still kind of the, the gold standard when it comes to drug development, in part because they're, they're cheap. They're cheap for development, cheap for screening. And in particular, in the, the stem cell field, there's been one small molecule in particular that I think is sort of universal, and that's a uh, ROC inhibitor, rokinase inhibitor, uh, which has really taken our field by storm and has enabled stem, basic stem cell research to, to take off because it enables the survival, the adhesion of cells and two-dimensional culture. And you actually had a Nature Methods paper that we covered recently on the show that kind of took that rock inhibitor story and, and you know took it to another level because you actually found a new approach to actually facilitate the viability of pluripotent stem cells and their differentiated progeny. Um, we've all heard about rock inhibitor, which is like I mentioned, a staple of stem cell culture and survival. But here you actually described a cocktail that you called SEPT. CEPT. It's a combination of chromin one emmercasin, polyamines, and trans-ISRIB, you know, abbreviated SEPT. I think it's a, it's a good abbreviation. So it's enhancing cell survival of genetically stable pluripotent stem cells by blocking a bunch of different stress mechanisms. And the, the reason why I like this paper in particular, because you showed all the different ways that this SEPT can be utilized to actually improve routine cell passaging, uh, cryopreservation, embryoid body and organoid formation, single cell cloning, genome editing. So it seems like there's a bunch of different great applications for the SEPT cocktail. Um, and tell us, so tell us a little bit more about this. How did you actually use high throughput screening to find SEPT? And do you think it's going to take off to a level where it might be even, might replace rock inhibitor one day? And how is it, uh, how can this become a staple of our field? That's the, the dream, right? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is a great example of how we can help the field um, and also highlights really the areas of expertise that, that NCATS is, is known for through so using chemical biology and high throughput screening uh, to you know, address important questions. Um, so I can tell you that this was really um, a project you know, close to my heart early on. Uh, so the first major project we started six years ago. Um, so going back and it, it, it basically asking the question, can we improve um, cell survival? So knowing that this has been a longstanding uh, problem in the field, um, as you pointed out, you know, the discovery of um, the ROC inhibitor Y27632 uh, in, back in 2007 has, has been a real, really important landmark discovery for the field. And ever since we have been using this, um, so taking a fresh look at this question, we um, started screening um, and used actually the rock inhibitor Y27 as, as the control. We wanted to find something you know, that potentially is better. Um, so taking an unbiased approach was really important. So we screened um, nearly 16,000 small molecule compounds 
um, so in, in tiny uh, mini wells. So, so using 1536 well plates um, and then found uh, initially 113 heads that seemed to improve cell survival. And then we could further narrow this down. And among these um, hits were uh, this, this compound you just mentioned, so chromin-1, it actually is also a rock inhibitor. Uh, so it is the same uh, mechanism, but it turned out chromin-1 is uh, a molecule that has been overlooked so far. Um, it turned out to be of the 20 rock inhibitors that were found in these 130 bits initially, the, the most potent and most selective. So we're using it at, at a very low concentration, 50 nanomolar, uh, chromin-1 is, is superior to 10 micromolar Y27. Um, so then as a next step, uh, we wanted to go further and ask if, if there could be other compounds that could synergize with chromin-1. And this was the discovery of, of Ambikassan. So using a different uh, screening approach, which we call matrix screening. Uh, so we basically combined 29 uh, compounds trying to look for synergy. And Emi Kassan was, was one of those hits that synergized with chromin-1. So this was great. It was given us essentially 50% more cell survival compared to um, Y27 alone. But, but the ultimate goal here was you know, to improve single cell cloning. Um, so when we use these two compounds and then went down decreased cell uh, numbers, so initially the screen was done at 500 cells per, per well, so going down to 10 cells, for instance, so we couldn't see this, you know, the, the, the beneficial effect wasn't really impressive. So we continued to do additional screens. So this is how we discovered the polyamines and, and transisrib. Um, and those four together really give you optimal outcome. Um, even if you go down to the most uh, stressful condition, which is single cell cloning. So one cell per well, and, and you really get um, you know, improved outcome, high efficiency of single cell cloning. But importantly, it's not just about the cell survival. Um, so what we found is, so, so if you use just the rock inhibitor by itself, the cells are still undergoing uh, cellular stress, including DNA damage, even if you do your regular routine passaging. So at each passage, you're, you're, you're creating uh, unwanted cell stress. And, and, and then another step we took was looking at these early time points, so three hours, six hours, uh, up to 24 hours post-passaging. So, so the first hours um, have not been carefully looked at in the field. And it turned out that the use of the SEP cocktail has a cytoprotective effect on the cells uh, versus you know, the, the Y27 compound I just mentioned, and then other commercially available um, reagents as well. So, so based on all these uh, experiments that we detailed in the paper, um, so we are really recommending to use SEPT uh, as an end-to-end -end solution for, for IPS cells. So for routine passaging, for cryopreservation thawing, um, for, for gene editing, uh, even for embryo body formation, organoid formation, et cetera. So the entire workflow is, is essentially improved by SEPs. And again, it's not just more cells that you get um, as, as, as the outcome, but you're preventing cell stress. So you, you don't have at each passage um, the stress that, that cells have to go through and then they recover. And then a couple of days later, you do this again and again. So it's kind of a hypothesis we are we're currently addressing uh, using whole genome sequencing, if actually this might be one of the reasons why higher passage um, IPS cell lines accumulate uh, karyotypic abnormality because they are undergoing stress. And, and, and Y27 is, is good, but it's still not good enough. And, and, and that's you know how you can uh, overcome this by using the SAP cocktail. And, and we have now received really great feedback from various companies and other groups who have tested the cocktail um, in their own laboratories. So, so based on that, this is, I think, really um, now a way for us to generate the next generation IPS alliance. 
um, that you can treat from the very beginning in the most optimal conditions. Uh, so that's you know what we're trying to do essentially going forward. Um, yeah, hopefully it will be useful for many out there. Yeah, I mean, end to end solution, as you said, is uh, would be. I mean, it's not even the the economy of it, you know, the financial economy of it, but just the economy of of the scale and 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 uh, the efficiency of the uh, the robots, probably in this case, that are going to be doing the work. But um, yeah, I mean, it seems like it, it's it's so critical to scale, right? Because as you said, it's these occult deteriorations of the stem cell lines, maybe in the Y two seven six three two that we don't see and as cells passage and then are going into people for presumably a long while. Um, it's really key that we are able to very carefully scrutinize these cells and make sure that they operate with high fidelity at scale, right? Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, you know, that speaks to this idea of, of, of the, we need standardization, right? Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, there's a lot of advances recently in genomics that have re re revolutionized pretty much every facet of medicine, and that's all centering around personalization, right, and patient specificity. That's the point of emphasis now in this precision medicine. Um, but for me, just intuitively, the idea of commercial scale and standardization and then personalization, they seem like opposing ideas, at, le at least in the space of cell-based therapies, right? And it seems like, you know, maybe strategically, some some uh, scientists have have changed their thinking. I know Japan pivoted from their kind of autologous, not kind of their autologous IPS based approach a few years back to do this IPS bank. So I'm asking you as someone who really is is straddling, I think, both ends of this, yeah, focusing on IPS cells for like, you know, neuropsychiatric or in this case, no receptor and disease modeling. But also I know you look at neuropsychiatric. Um, conditions. So you're, you dabble in the patient specificity, but also your major space is the standardization. Is there an overlap um, between these two ideas that can be practical therapeutically? Yeah, great question. I, I think it's, it's not mutually exclusive. I mean, you could develop both therapies in parallel, right? So in, in, in the context of rare diseases, for instance, you're, you're at this point talking about um, N of one, right? So, so developing therapies that would be just specific for one patient, right? And, and as you do these, um, you know, therapy developments for, for many patients, right? Uh, N of one becomes kind of a large population. Um, so that being said, um, I think it's, it's not mutually exclusive. You, you can have these personalized therapies, but at the same time, continue developing strategies that, that are based on the idea of having off-the-shelf products, right? Um, so, so in that regard, um, you know, I mean, both approaches are valid and, and, and can inform each other, including, um, you know, innovative strategies using gene editing and, and trying to make cells, you know, universally applicable. So changing the, you know, the HLA signature. Um, and, and there is, work on the way actually doing that. So, so you may have cells that you have genetically modified and then um, universally apply to, to any patient. And, and also the question of uh, circumventing um, immunosuppression long-term, I think it's still an important um, challenge that we have to address. Um, yeah, but overall, I think um, it should, it could, you can do both on, 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 and, and depending on your business model as a company um, and, and knowing and better controlling the different steps of IPSL reprogramming, scaling up quickly using cost-efficient differentiation protocols. Um, so it doesn't need to take, you know, many, many years to, to get there even for, for personalized cell therapies. I think we've come a long way. And at the same time, there's, there's a lot we don't know about the basic science of stem cells and in particular, how they may be influenced by certain unique environments. And on, on that topic, we actually had the chance to work together on a, 
a favorite topic of mine last year. As our listeners know, I'm a big fan of space and everything stem cell biology in space. Uh, you were actually a speaker and participant for our Biomanufacturing in Space Symposium, which actually gathered thought leaders in the areas of tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, stem cell biology, and space-based research to figure out some of the most promising opportunities to leverage the International Space Station, of all things, and low Earth orbit uh, platforms to actually, you know, perhaps improve space-based biomanufacturing. So this is sort of a, you know, you're of course an expert in all things biomanufacturing and industrial scale. Um, but, you know, this is a very far-fetched idea that's becoming slowly more and more of a reality. We're starting to send more and more experiments to the ISS and to low Earth orbit to actually figure out what's happening to stem cells in space. It's in its infancy, this field. And I think a lot of folks in the stem cell field have shown interest in doing research in space. And there's some early data that shows perhaps stem cell production and differentiation could be altered by spaceflight or, or low gravity. But, you know, from your perspective as somebody who's really into biomanufacturing, what do we need to learn on the basic science level before we can actually even think about routinely using this really unique environment in microgravity to, to facilitate biomanufacturing? So it's, it's really early in this field, but what excites you the most about this prospect of stem cell research in space? Yeah, uh, as you said, this is really a fascinating field, um, now becoming more available to different groups. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, still in its infancy, but, but also invites lots of, you know, creative ideas. Um, so, so we simply have to, you know, continue to, continue to, to gather data and, 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 um, try to interpret these findings and, and, and compare carefully to what we know already about stem cells. Um, and as you said, there's also still a lot, you know, to be figured out about the basic biology of stem cells. It is again, I think an opportunity that, that it can enable us to learn new things um, and, 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 you know, make sure that, you know, we are open-minded about, you know, how we have been seeing stem cells. It, it might be possible that, um, you know, questions around aging, senescence, um, you know, cellular stress. I mean, these are all questions that are fundamental for, for safety. Um, and, and addressing these questions, you know, in space and, and you know, circling back to, to what we know about stem cells. I think it, 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 is, it is a unique um, opportunity to, uh, leverage, you know, and improve efficiency because everything we want to learn in space eventually will, uh, that's the basic idea, benefit us here in, in biomedical research or, you know, or in general human, um, you know, mankind. Um, so the questions around, as I said, um, senescence, um, you know, how does you know, the cell cycle change or being regulated. Um, so, so we simply need data and, and, and well-designed experiments and lots of data sharing across uh, different organ systems that we can um, start laying out, uh, you know, a roadmap that, that uh, can help us with even further um, improving the, the biomanufacturing and standardization question. Yeah, I always said everyone loves to throw out that stat about the space race and what an amazing boost it gave to technology across the board. Um, and, you know, you have to wonder if just trying to figure out how to make these systems work in space um, could provide some similar ancillary insight. And, and not to mention that, like, of, of all the variables to, to, to switch, to muck around with, um, gravity's got to be influencing uh, some parts of the system, many, you know, we had to just had Sarah Wickstrom, Wickstrom on the, on the show last episode talking about, you know, biomechanics and, and, and that influence. And, and it's really underappreciated, I think. So of course, yes, we got to get off the planet to appreciate some of these questions and glean some of these insights. So I'm glad you and Arun are doing that. I'm going to stay here on earth. Um, just before we let you go, I have, uh, uh we have a couple of, uh, peripheral questions for you. The first one is, 
Um, if you could answer any single scientific question, regardless of your expertise or chosen field, what would that be? So, yeah, when I first started getting interested in, in doing science, I think, you know, the, the, the fascination with the brain, with the human brain is still something I'm, um, yeah, very excited about. I'm, I'm, I'm just hoping that one day we will have really a more complete understanding of the human brain as well as its diseases, uh, especially cognitive diseases. Um, so, yeah, it was a good starting point um, for my for my scientific journey. Um, that I was early on in an environment back in Freiburg in Germany with a really strong uh, neuroscience community. So that was kind of the you know the excitement about neuroscience and the human brain. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also hoping that using stem cells we can come closer to that question. You know generate these more complex models in vitro. Well, if you're looking for a bigger mystery than the universe, I think maybe it's the mind because that's that's something that seems as inscrutable. Um, finally, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever been given, either professional or not? Um, I would say never give up hope. Um, you know, if things can be tough, um, doing research, but also in general, uh, as a scientist, you know, taking your journey, um, but also, you know, going back all the way to, to med school, I think, you know, never give up hope uh, is, I think, an important thing to keep in mind. And then many years later, when I came to NIH, I was, you know, uh, really fascinated to hear that actually Dr. Francis Collins is calling the NIH sometimes, it's the National Institutes of Hope. Um, yeah, so this is, I think, important to keep that in mind um, and, and you know, keep going and, and trying harder uh, to solve these scientific problems that will ultimately benefit patients. Yeah, I mean, you would think, I'm glad to hear that National Institute of Hope because a lot of my hopes have died in the, on the grant review boards there, but I think it's a testament to every researcher who goes up against it, right? Is they keep going, right? And no one ever, stops writing grants or a few do so I, I think that while it can be punishing it's just like you know the the mysteries of biology but you can't stop asking the questions right and it's great to see that you're asking questions on earth in the mind and specifically in this biomanufacturing space i really think that you're moving the needle and it's it's so again i just have to emphasize how pleased i am to see that it's someone at the nih leading the charge getting these cells into people. So thanks for joining us and thanks for sharing your insights and your story with us, Dr. Singa. Yeah, thanks so much. Oh, great fun. Thank you for having me. That brings us to the end of this episode. What a great one it was. We had those bombshell roundup papers and combined with a leader at the NIH bringing these stem cells to the fore. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the notes for this show, including the episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. You guys got a, a few weeks to get those emails in and messages and tweets because we're taking a short break but like we said at the outset, we're going to be back on January 11th with a brand new show. Be sure to tune in for that. Thanks for listening.